Over thousands of years, landscapes have been transformed for pragmatic purposes, growing food or fibre. But often, landscapes are turned into gardens, purely for beauty. Their aesthetic soothes or stimulates our senses, like works of art in a gallery. And they can also nourish our souls. The Australian garden we're about to explore is divided into 20 garden rooms, each with its own character. It's a bit like a national gallery exhibiting international pieces. So when we enter it, will we momentarily forget what country we're in? The Southern Highlands is a mecca for garden lovers. It's only an hour or so drive southwest from Sydney's metropolis, but it could be a thousand kilometres away. Historic villages such as Berrima and Exeter draw visitors year round. And despite also being by the busy Illawarra Highway, this picturesque hamlet of Sutton Forest retains an essence of days gone by. I'm about to visit nearby Red Cow Farm, a curious name for a garden. The owners, Ali Mentesh and Wayne Morrissey, are from diverse backgrounds. Ali is originally from Cyprus, and Wayne's Australian. East meets west, or rather, north meets south. I imagine this garden's going to be a fusion of both, but I could be wrong. This is Red Cow Farm. The entrance is quite cottagey, and it suits the historic dwelling. It'll be interesting to find out how long Ali and Wayne have been gardening here. They said to meet them in a woodland, a hazelnut grove. Let's see. I like this curved pergola. I like its proportions. They're generous and the gentle curve. It leads you on. Well, that's not a woodland. It's far too formal. It's stunning. It could be Italy. Now this is a contrast to that front cottage garden. This is very formal, very serene. Is this Australia? Could be France. These beech hedges are beautifully manicured, and soon, in the winter, their leaves will turn a burnt umber. And suddenly, the mood changes here in the hazelnut grove. There's a great atmosphere under these trees. Being in your garden really is like being in an art gallery. So many rooms, each with a different style. What was here before you guys began? How paddocks, um, Eamon. Red Cow Farm originally formed part of a 25 hectare land grant to the ex-convict John Sewell in 1822. We purchased the property in 1991 and commenced the uh, massive task of transforming a cow paddock into a garden. The cottage appears quite old. When was it built? The present cottage, Eamon, was built round about 1880. There was an earlier cottage which was built round about 1830. Ali, did you draw up a garden plan before you started? It didn't come straight away all at once, but what we've done is the need to, to create garden rooms and the uh, majority of the hedges I went in at the early stages and that was to get the structure upright and then to um, uh, you know, fill the inside of the garden areas later on once the hedges were established. And then the, the need came to creating like different garden rooms like the woodland area, uh, the lake, um, the more formal structured areas. Um, and as the ideas grew, we sort of developed the, um, all these different areas at different stages. 
I suppose everything you're doing now, is it readiness for spring? Yes, uh, there will be lots of uh, mulching, uh, planting and pruning to be done for a spring. The Abbas Garden, that's an interesting name. Should I expect to see any nuns? Uh, you could do. <laughs> Uh, this is an um, area enclosed by um, hornbeam and beech hedges and it's a great area for uh, contemplation. These uh, box hedge cones are magnificent and they seem to echo the shape of the, uh, the retreat over in the corner. Was that an intentional thing? Yes, I, cones are actually representing the, the nuns or the monks working in the fields. Well, this is the, um, the oratory and it's the um, area for um, contemplation in the garden. That's fantastic. I like the way you've brought in the concept of an ecclesiastical garden and the use of faith in the garden. Yes, um, we both love the, uh, the colourful history of the, the Christianity and the, um, the wonderful um, the art that was created um, uh, for the religion. So um, that was actually a decision making to, to transplant that idea to the garden with the selection of uh, sumptuous roses, uh, the wonderful perfumes, and the, the, the feel for the, uh, for the garden with the structuring. So it's, we think it's working for that reason. Did you consciously colour theme this area? Yes, we did. The, the garden actually starts with the, the theming of uh, yellow and white, and then it moves on to yellow apricot colours, then to apricot pinks, to uh, the clear pinks and then to uh, strong pinks to crimsons. I can see the colour in the remnants of the autumn roses. I aim and we do prune them from about June till about August and in preparation for the spring flowering onwards. Ali and Wayne have used hedges with great effect and I especially like how they've used so many different varieties to section off rooms and areas. Each has its own characteristics. In the Abbas Garden, hedges have created the perfect sense of enclosure. Height's important also. The larger the room, the higher the hedge can be. We're curious creatures. If you can't see over a hedge, you want to find out what's behind it. There's a sense of expectation. What secrets will be revealed? Is this area of the garden lower than the rest? It is. We have selected plants to cope with the situation. It's a mainly a natural planting with grasses, with strong growing perennials. So you intentionally left out any formal elements? Definitely. And um, usually there's no staking required for this plant. Um, and as a result, uh, we do get wonderful uh, textural effects uh, with the autumn turnings and with a very long season uh, interest in this part of the garden. So you've intentionally left this part of the garden open to the paddocks? Uh, we do uh, like intermediate spaces in the garden, but we also uh, do enjoy the um, open, long views and the countryside. I like the light hitting the seed heads. Yes, these are all the different varieties of miscanthus, and we love the, the structuring of them and the, the way they carry light. Uh, it gives us so much uh, interest right throughout the season. Are there actually any red cows in the paddocks? Uh, yes, uh, there used to be, but we haven't seen them probably for about three years. Although the, um, the property was already named Red Cow Farm and uh, it was an important area for uh, this breed of cows, which were the Hereford cows. Well, I'm glad you've stuck with tradition and the name endures. I'm reminded of the Dutch garden designer Piet Udoff. Some of his work includes sweeps of grasses and perennials left to mellow as the seasons turn. He attributes his inspiration to nature, art and time. There's some incredible textures on the foliage in this bog garden and it's very well positioned near the lake. Yes, it's, uh, it's an important area, this bog garden, because it does very much depend on the, the moisture coming from the, the, the lake um, to, to, to feed the area. So we can uh, establish this wonderful plants that we have in here. 
and you've got great statuary throughout the garden. Uh, I noticed the pan-like sculpture in the hazelnut grove and you've got this sleeping nymph here. Where do you source the statues? Uh, some of them are sourced overseas, some of them are what we find on our travels and like this particular piece next to us is actually commissioned and it was made for us. And who's the character on the other side of the lake? Is it a satire? Uh, yes, it is uh, a pan actually. What a wonderful bridge. Seasoned timber, mellow tones. Certainly rustic, Eamon. <laughs> Certainly rustic. It's almost a metaphor for the garden, uniting it all together, different backgrounds. It's certainly, Eamon. That's a very nice way to put it. Well, I feel like I'm at Givalny. Yes, Eamon, that's a uh, comment we seem to be getting all the time. Oh, well, yeah. you should actually sell them. You know, Givalny copied Red Cow Farm. They did a terrible job. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a lot of decision making that obviously goes on when you're extending the garden and, and working in it. How do you come to reach a decision? Well, I, I think when you consider the, the magnitude of our project, there has had to have been a certain amount of compromise. <laughs> <laughs> so compromise is always the key? Always. Who compromises yes. the most though? Oh, I think it's pretty <laughs> much 50-50. <laughs> <laughs> who, who is one more of a designer and one more of a worker or? I think Ali is more the designer. Yeah, this, this, this old bridge for instance was Thanks, Ali's, <laughs> uh, Ali's design. One of our first uh, features actually, this bridge. Yes. And you built it yourselves? No, I have to say we didn't. This is probably the only feature we didn't, didn't. Uh, build. This it's actually made elegant. of all hardwood and we were adamant that it didn't have any... Um, modern timber amongst mo Modern it. timber. It's, um, and no nailing, so it, that's, mm. that's how it came about. So. Well, it's weathering very well. Yes. Wayne, you said you don't bring many people into the garden. Is most of the work done by the two of you? Absolutely, yes. How many days a week are you out here? Well, we both work jobs away from here. You probably appreciate gardening is an expensive hobby. <laughs> so um, I, I'm here three full days a week. And, and Ali the same. So on those days we're working from dawn till well after dusk, generally. Oh well you must really enjoy it. Good for the soul. The pond appears to be the heart of the garden, a pivotal point. Water always draws attention. Apart from reflecting the garden and sky, its life force is palpable. I can see the layers, particularly the trees that create a living tapestry. This canopy would be an ever-changing canvas, from autumn's rich palette, through winter's bare and delicate tracery, to spring's lush, fresh foliage. Then in summer, there'd be a deep, cool shade. Just look at these patterns in the trees. They all have different forms and colors. I can see that while Ali and Wayne are absolutely passionate about plants, especially all the rare and unusual ones they grow, there's nothing random about their placement. Each has been thoughtfully considered. This garden's design hasn't in any way been compromised. So uh, what did you find, Eamon? Well, I haven't found the monastery garden yet, but I did find some lovely wild areas. Oh, yes. This is um, inspired by uh, William Robinson and um, his book called The Wild Garden. So it's virtually um, the composition of, of wonderful trees and shrubs and um, that very naturalistic look that you try to achieve with your garden. Yeah, no, I can certainly see his influence mm. around the garden. I've noticed that you have some stunning trees and they seem to come from you know, all around the world. Mm -hmm. How do they survive here? Uh, it seems to suit them very well, the, the microclimate or the conditions that is provided for them. And uh, there's a wonderful collection of trees here that we have acquired over the years, including zelkovas, uh, tulip trees, and uh, a very big collection of Japanese maples and its cultivars. 
All the trees seem to be thriving. I noticed a spot across the garden where you'd placed a seat and the scale of the trees is enormous and the mm. seat shows that with a great vantage point. Yes, it's, um, it's, it's a, a clump of um, sequoias and um, it does give us the, the height and the structure that we need in that part of the garden and it also provides uh, and, and traps the, uh, the, the wonderful scent that we get from our plants including the, uh, the violets which is uh, planted under the seat and all the, the woodlanders that love those sort of conditions. Great spot to ponder and reflect. Definitely, and to, again to contemplate and uh, to relax. Of course, in winter, the garden will have its own quiet charm. While hedges retain formality, and some are even accentuated, the wild garden will still be enchanting. Spent grasses and seed pods will be left for as long as possible. And winter's a time when some tree trunks get to star without the competition from foliage. Copsed willows sprout iridescent shoots. Although filigree branches, spreading delicately, also have appeal. Other dazzling stars are winter roses, which have naturalised, and amongst the fall and autumn leaves, snowdrops and gentiana will emerge to brighten the landscape. And of course, work completed before spring brings its own rewards. But for now, I'm looking forward to seeing another room in this gallery that Wayne's going to show me. Wayne, this is incredible. I didn't realise the monastery garden was going to be so extraordinary. Yes, it's, it, this was our first major feature. We uh, originally had planned it um, for herbs and medicinal um, planting that was always associated with the ancient monasteries. But over the years, it's changed the planting. Uh, we've got more in now to perennials. Still trying to keep it all within the monastic flavour. So from this central axis, you can see through to the orchard and on this side, what looks like a vegetable patch. So the gardens are, are very productive and they obviously nurture the soul as well. Exactly, Eamon, yes. I like the way this garden is punctuated with the statues of the saints. Where did you find those? From our travels, um, a couple of them here were made by a local artist, Patrice Cook. She's made St. Fiaca for us. She's also made the monastic bell up here. Um, but there's quite a variety of saints that have taken up residence here over the centuries. Do you have a favourite? Oh, I think the good old St Francis, the patron saint of uh, ecology. And of course our present Pope has taken his name. Uh, yes. I like St Jude, Pope so, for the hopeless. That's exactly <laughs> right, yes. A prayer or two in his direction I believe works wonders. The layout is quite traditional based on a Celtic cross. Small box hedges contain exuberant plantings. Not just the herbs, vegetables, a few roses and lilies of a traditional monastery garden, but a wonderful collection of perennials. Many of the rich, deep colours were inspired by 14th and 15th century tapestries. The bell and the font add atmosphere. Variegated ivy fills the recessed arches along the back wall. And again, hedges are used here so effectively. Glossy leaved laurels make the perfect deep green backdrop. And the towering pines outside the garden give it a sense of enclosure. They're quaint cottages. Are they historic? This one isn't uh, Aemon. We built this uh, for the chickens. But in this immediate area, there are some very, very historic uh, homes like the remains of the Red Cow Inn about a hundred metres down the road and of course Red Cow Farm itself. It is a very historic area and it's a credit to Wayne and Ali 
that their garden, although only a couple of decades old, sits so comfortably in this context. There's a confluence of ideas in all the garden rooms, possibly reflecting diverse backgrounds, certainly showing teamwork and a shared vision. It's exceeded its reputation. Ali and Wade have created an extraordinary 20-room Australian guarded gallery. Statuary has its own stage. Plants are treated with reverence. The exhibitions are ever-changing. No wonder Red Cow Farm is so popular with visitors from around the world. This Australian garden adopts universal design principles. It's also whimsical, romantic and elegant. Beauty transcends all cultures. Thank you.